All right, this is the uh, first of the midweek question and answer sessions that I'll have. And this is uh, for uh, questions that are under the market update video that I put out on Sunday. Some of them require uh, a little bit more detailed answer than I feel like typing. And I don't like typing a lot. So it's just easier for me to aggregate them all and put them in a video. And I can get them done a lot faster if I could just talk through them and draw pictures rather than type out words. Uh, sometimes questions will cluster. So two or three questions uh, I can handle with the same answer. Uh, so I'll put them on the screen. And I'll just uh, take a screenshot of the question and put it on the screen. I won't uh, use any, uh, any names or anything like that. You'll recognize your own question. So we have, uh, over the last week, we've had commodities and oil sell off on the back of a strong U.S. dollar and weakening demand. Bond yields have enjoyed this, and the yield curve is flat and teetering on inversion. Do you see value in buying long-duration bonds here, positioning for the yield curve to invert, given you expect a recession in the U.S.? And if that is what you expected, that does make sense. You would add duration at this point. Uh, the second is, could you please go over uh, rates 210, 510, etc., and help understand what they are telling us? Uh, and um, I can answer that with the same uh, with the same answer here. Let's start with just a uh, simplified yield curve, and let's eliminate inflation from our thinking because it makes it really easy. Uh, and let's just assume there are no negative real yields for now. If there are negative real yields, whatever curve I draw, you can shift it down into the negative territory if you want. You would get an upward sloping curve if we were just looking at real rates. Because it's quite simple, if you're going to lend money for 20 years, you're going to want a higher coupon than if you lent money for one year. That is called the maturity premium. And that is why uh, the uh, yield curve tends to be upward sloping is because you expect that if I'm going to lend money for a longer period of time, there's more risk. Even though it's the U.S. government, there's still more risk. I still want a higher coupon for lending money for a longer period of time. Okay, let's introduce inflation, but we'll introduce it slowly. What we'll do first is we'll assume that inflation is well behaved at the central bank target of 2% and that expectations are that it will remain at 2%. Um, so the inflation premium that would be added to the yield curve that I drew over here wouldn't be flat. It would be slightly upward sloping. Um, this is uh, inflation expectations. And the further out you go, you have a premium for the uncertainty of your inflation expectations. So it would be slightly upward sloping. So when we combine the two together, we should get a curve that is steeper than the real curve uh, and uh, higher by the amount of whatever inflation expectation and uncertainty uh, premium uh, related to inflation that we would have. And our typical yield curve normally is upward sloping. Let's uh, just uh, take this, let's bring it down here. And I'm just gonna lower this curve here just assume that uh, I've lowered all of the numbers on this side here, that it is actually at the same level I drew it before. Now let's introduce inflation with a central bank that just sits on the sidelines. Central bank is not going to react to it at first, but the um, uh, inflation uh, expectations begin to increase. Not just the uncertainty of the expectation, but the inflation expectation begins to increase. You will start to get something that looks like this. You'll get a curve that starts to uh, steepen, and that is called a bear steepener because as rates go up, bond prices go down. So you'll get a bear steepener. And if the central bank begins to act on that, well, the short end of the curve will begin to rise with, begin with the rising rates, and some of this inflation expectation will start to moderate. So you might get something that looks like this then. And as they increase rates, you'll get something that looks like this. Uh, and if they keep increasing rates, what's going to happen at some point is there's going to be a belief that this inflation is going to come out of the curve. So you're going to get something that starts to look like this. It's going to flatten with the long end of the curve coming down and the short end of the curve coming up, which is what we're seeing, or at least what we've seen over the last three weeks, is we've seen that kind of flattening of the curve, more of a twist of the curve. 
um, because the long end has been coming down, the short end has been going up. So that if you were uh, uh, long capital market bonds, uh, you did well over the last three weeks. If it is believed that continually increasing rates is going to cause a recession, uh, what's going to happen out of this end of the curve, two things are going to happen. Inflation expectations are really going to start to come out of the long end of the curve. And the anticipation of lower interest rates are going to come out of the end of the curve. So you raise rates a little too much and you get this kind of inverted yield curve. What is this telling us? Uh, let's say there's the two year, there's the 10 year right there. You have an inversion, typically 40 to 50 basis points, negative 40 uh, to 50 basis points is your typical curve inversion. And when we see something like that, it is telling us that the market is expecting two things, a recession, uh, lower rates in the future, uh, and secondly, lower inflation expectations because the best way to cure inflation is to kill demand, is to cause a recession. So if you believe, you have to believe two things. You have to believe uh, that a recession, that the recession is gonna happen. So that a recession is imminent. Uh, and inflation expectations, not inflation itself, but inflation expectations will drop. Well, we've seen this going on in the long end of the curve uh, over the last couple of weeks. Inflation expectations are coming down. If we look at the break-even rates, which is taking a nominal yield, so we can take the 10-year uh, nominal yield, which is the Treasury yield minus the 10-year TIPS yield, uh, and you'll get uh, the break-even rate. Uh, and that break-even rate will tell you at what level of inflation you would be indifferent between having a 10-year treasury and having a 10-year tips. That's the inflation expectation that's built into the 10-year. We've seen inflation expectations coming down over the last, uh, I think, three weeks now. Uh, since uh, the high in rates on June 14th, they've all been coming down. So if you believe this and you believe this, then yes, uh, to answer your question, uh, buying long duration bonds here, positioning for that would make a lot of sense because if the infl if a recession does happen and inflation expectations disappear very quickly, the Fed will hop camps. They'll hop into the recession camp and they'll begin to lower rates. And when they begin to lower rates, the low end of the curve drops and the long end of the curve drops and you get something like this as well. And this is called a bull steepener, bullish because lowering rates means rising prices and you're going from an inverted or a flat curve to a steeper curve. Okay, that one's done. Okay, this one is about the yen. I will partially answer this question because the next question is about uh, sovereign debt risk. I will um, spill the rest of this question over to the next screen when we answer both those questions at the same time. I asked this on last week's video, but it would be great to get some commentary on the yen US um, on Wednesday. So for uh, these two currencies, in the U.S. you have rates rising and in Japan you have rates low. They're still negative. The, the bank, uh, the BOJ, uh, has the target rate at negative 0.1 percent and they've said we're going to leave it here and we may go even lower, lower than 0.1 percent. Their core CPI is sitting at 2.1 percent. Uh, so they do have the luxury of sitting on that for a while. So the yen is dropping in value because of the differential uh, in interest rates. But there's a little bit of a problem here. Uh, Japan is uh, sort of between a rock and a hard place. Damned if they do, damned if they don't. Um, lowering yen is boosting import costs, especially on fuel and raw materials. And if this continues on, it will cause consumption to drop, thereby offsetting the support of monetary policy they have going on right now. Uh, which means they're going to have to make some move to fix this problem so that they don't have consumption dropping. However, they got a lot of debt. Uh, one of their other policies are uh, trying to cap the tenure at 0.25%. Uh, and to do that, the BOJ has pledged to buy an unlimited number or an unlimited quantity of 10-year JGBs. Um, they already own more than 50% of the debt, by the way. 95% of Japan's sovereign debt is held domestically. That makes it uh, less risky. 
It's uh, uh, because they owe it to their own citizens. And since they have taxing authority and they owe this to their own citizens, they can, they can solve that problem. The BOJ owns over 50% of the debt that's held uh, of, of this debt. Um, but they also have assets. They have $1.3 trillion in U.S. Treasuries. So as the U.S. dollar rises, the value of their holdings continue to rise as well. So they're doing well on that side. How much does this represent of their total debt? It's about 16% of uh, Japanese sovereign debt. Uh, and as the interest rate differential keeps widening and the yen keeps weakening, this becomes more and more and more valuable uh, to Japan. Japan does have a history of currency intervention and they will need reserves. Look at the size of the reserves they have. If they need to get reserves, uh, they can liquidate some of their treasuries because every U.S. dollar buys so much more yen than when they originally bought these, uh, these treasuries. I don't know that they would wholesale liquidate a lot of treasuries, but when we think about their debt, we also have to think about their assets. So if I ask somebody, how much money do you owe? $10,000. Well, is that a lot? It depends on your assets. If you have assets of a million, that's nothing. If you have no assets, well, you're broke. So we do have to consider, yeah, they have a lot of debt, but they owe it to their own people. Um, they have super, super low interest rates on this. Um, how much debt do you want to carry at negative 0.1%? You do that all day long. You're making money. Do it all day long right? And 16% uh, of their debt, you could say, is immunized uh, with uh, holdings of $1.3 in treasuries. Still, though, they got a bit of a problem. If they don't raise rates, the yen will continue to weaken and it will push Japan into a recession because they import, they have no raw material production uh, and they have no domestic fuel production in terms of any of the carbon-based fuels. Uh, and they have a bit of a, a nuclear aversion right now, uh, given Fukushima. Uh, so if this continues on, uh, it's going to get to the point where their fuel and raw material costs uh, just are, are way too exorbitant. They're going to have to step in and support that currency, or they're going to have to raise rates. But raising rates isn't something I see in their future. Uh, so currency intervention is probably going to be the more likely course that they would take. Okay, to continue on with uh, Japan's government debt here uh, and the yen or its relationship to the yen, uh, let's bring in this next question. Uh, I would truly appreciate an analysis of a country's solvency. Um, not a problem. Uh, I'll show you. Uh, we'll go look at the uh, CFR, uh, Council on Foreign Relations, the Sovereign Risk Tracker, uh, and uh, see how they do it. Um, I see so many countries that have historically high debt to GDP ratios, and here we are, a uh, full chart of all the countries in their uh, debt to GDP. This, uh, the link uh, to both uh, the sovereign risk tracker and to this, this is from Big Think. Uh, Big Think has, uh, it's a great website. You can get lost there all day long. All the beautiful charts they have uh, and the way they can display data is just absolutely incredible. I think I've, uh, in one of my previous market updates, I think I uh, mentioned big thing. Uh, I see so many countries that have historically high debt to GDP ratios, and I don't really have an intuitive framework uh, to understand uh, how you can quant quantively analyze a country's ability to pay its debts. And there are things you look at, uh, the deficit to GDP ratio, the amount of foreign reserves, which the sovereign risk tracker does for us. And we'll look at, uh, at what it tracks and, and how it rates the countries. And it gives us a ranking from 0 all the way to 10. 10 being over 50% probability of default. Uh, and we'll look at an interactive map that, that breaks it down for us. Uh, we're not going to have uh, the access to the information or even the skill set really to start doing credit analysis at a country level. It's best to let experts do that and just ask ourselves, hey, is there any good secondary research that already exists uh, that I could refer to as opposed to undertaking some primary research on my own? Let's look at this. Uh, actually, well, let's, let's start here. This is uh, uh, Japan's government uh, debt as a percentage of GDP from 1994 to 2022. Uh, Japan was on fire throughout the 80s, absolutely on fire with a property market that was um, 
if you want to talk about something being expensive, I mean, one foot of a property uh, in Tokyo was worth more than uh, sometimes a whole building in New York. It was ridiculous. And then it all crashed and it all went away. Uh, and they never got it back uh, during uh, the, the uh, breakdown in the uh, 1989, 1990, 91. They never came out of that. The U.S. came out of, they had a, a housing crash as well, a real estate crash in the 90s, but then early 90s, and they came out of it. Uh, Japan never did. Uh, so they started, uh, they kept rates low for a very, very long time because they had low inflation and they could, and they tried to reflate uh, uh, the economy and they kept trying and trying and trying. Oddly enough, the yen was getting stronger and stronger and stronger during this period of time. In 2010, 2011, you had a yen that was pushing 76. So uh, one US dollar got 76 yen. We're pushing 135, 140 right now. Um, this was uncomfortable for the Bank of Japan. They didn't like uh, a currency that was this strong. It was making their uh, exports uncompetitive. Uh, so they did do currency intervention. They did it twice. Actually, they did it three times. They did it uh, uh, twice in a concerted fashion. Uh, I remember once, the, the first time they announced this, they said Thursday night at 9, uh, New York time, we're going to intervene in the currency. The currency was sitting at about 77 and a half. And it was a coordinated action from six central banks uh, to drive down the value of the yen. Uh, so that every central bank was going to sell its yen reserves and buy uh, other currencies. And they pushed it from 77.5 to about 84, 85. Uh, and they announced it, which seemed rather silly to me. So I took a position in it before they announced it. And sure enough, by about 9.20, it was, it was done. It was 20 minutes of concerted selling of the yen. I rode that wave. Thank you very much for telling me. You know, but uh, there it was didn't hold. It uh, went back uh, past 80 to 76. So they said, we're just going to start printing yen. Uh, and uh, the yen just started to decrease. And uh, this, they uh, went sideways here on uh, the amount of debt. This is uh, COVID, the reaction to, uh, uh, to COVID. Uh, and this is uh, not all up to date. It continued on. Uh, but they do have a history of intervention. If we look at uh, debt to government, uh, debt to GDP by country. Um, Japan is the middle circle here. The bullseye of this has the highest uh, amount. Then you have the, uh, you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven countries in the next ring. And then the third ring over, I've circled uh, Canada over here and the U.S. over here. Let's actually just go to this site where we can see this uh, a little bit bigger, and then we'll uh, go over to uh, the Sovereign Risk Tracker. Okay, so the site is Big Think. Uh, spend some time there. It is absolutely uh, uh, fantastic. The types of information you get, the questions you didn't even think you'd be interested in, but you see the answers displayed graphically, and you think, oh my God, I never knew that. Uh, anyways, what do we got here? Japan, 256.9%. The next circle here, what have we got? Sudan, Greece, Eritrea, Cape Verde, Italy, uh, Sumatra. Uh, I can't even read it, it's so small. And Barbados over here in the second ring. And then here's the third ring here. You have Canada at 109.9 uh, or 110. U.S. at 133.3. But, you know, we've, we've done this already where we've backed out well, what is the Fed holding? Because really, that's just the government that owes itself money. We backed it out. What does it owe uh, um, other people? And we get we, we drop it down to about 100% uh, from where it was. Uh, Canada's at about 110%. But again, the Bank of Canada here, much like the Fed, is holding uh, Canadian government bonds as well. So you'd have to back that out. And then you have this, this ring out here. And then as you get further out, uh, these are countries with uh, lower debt to GDP. I know it's hard to read on this screen, uh, so I'm going to give you, uh, again, the link in the description box. You can go and you can have some fun with this, but there's some narration here that talks about, uh, that talks about the debt, talks about Japan, uh, and you can get more information on that. Let's look at the sovereign uh, um, um, the risk tracker. Um, so it highlights certain countries, and uh, let's just scroll down here for a second. 
Here are the things that it looks at. The current account balance as a share of GDP. Uh, external debt as a share of GDP. The more external debt, the riskier it is, the more internal debt. Remember, Japan, 95% of its debt is held domestically, right? Only 5% is external. Reserve adequacy ratios, government debt as a share of GDP, fiscal balance as a share of GDP. If you've been through um, uh, level two uh, in the currency reading, right at the very end, we do talk about uh, what the risk signs are of an impending, uh, um, I think it was in the currency, or it's in one of the fixed income readings, or it might even be at level three now that I, now that I think about it. Yeah, I think it's at level three, sorry. Uh, and it talks about what, what what are the warning signs of a fiscal uh, um, uh, or of a, a default. And all of these measures are in there. Index of political instability, credit default swap spread. So let's go back up here and see what we have. Um, the darker it is, uh, you're, you're getting closer to 10. 10 means 50% or higher chance of defaulting in the next five years. So you have Russia, and when you hover over it, it gives you all of the details here, right? Uh, well, let's get it back. Current account, 6.9% of GDP. External debt, 30% of GDP. Short-term debt and current account, negative 14% of reserves. Government debt, 15% of GDP. So it gives you a whole bunch of information. Credit default swap spread, look at that, 6,234 uh, uh, basis points. Incredible. Uh, you have Argentina down here. It gives you uh, a bunch of information there as well. Look at the credit default swaps right there, 2,212. Versus something like, uh, let's say, India over here. Look at its credit default swaps right at 118 basis points, right? Egypt is a big one. Uh, Ghana is another one. Tunisia is another one. Venezuela is another one here as well. Notice that Japan doesn't even show up. Japan's a zero. With as much debt as it has, it's a zero. Canada and the U.S., both zeros as well, but Mexico shows up here as a one. If you look at their credit default swap spread, 121 basis points. So I, I don't know that I would dive into a country and start calculating all of these ratios when it's these ratios that I would say you'd want to pay attention to. This does it for you, uh, and it keeps it up to date, So, and it gives you the 10 most at risk. Uh, Argentina, Ghana, Lebanon, Pakistan, Russia, Sri Lanka. Well, Sri Lanka is down there. Uh, look at its uh, credit default swap spread, 2,735 basis points. Gives you the top 10. I think you just have to pay attention uh, to the top 10. Okay, a number of questions that I can answer uh, just verbally without a lot of writing or drawing here. First one, do you think the lack of workers will weigh on the speed of the electrification and transformation of our transportation systems in the absence of changes of immigration policies? And one story I saw today on uh, Bloomberg uh, is that uh, U.S. companies uh, have begun uh, reshoring jobs, that jobs are now coming back to the U.S. So yeah, I think for the U.S., uh, immigration is a hot-button topic. Uh, and you have a Congress and a Senate and a White House that pretty much is very busy with just trying to stop the other side from doing anything or embarrassing the other side, but not really doing anything or getting anything done. Uh, and being that it's one of those hot button American topics, yeah, that could be a problem because the U.S. does have a, um, an upside down population now. More people going into retirement uh, every year than are entering the workforce every year. Uh, so you're losing, you're losing workers. So the participation rate has dropped. The pandemic accelerated that, accelerated a lot of the retirements. So unless Americans get busy replicating uh, or immigrating, yeah, you're going you're gonna to get to a point where onshoring of jobs just doesn't make sense anymore simply because the, um, the rate to hire them would be excessive. However, However, the beautiful thing here is if you look south, you have Mexico. Labor costs in Mexico are actually now cheaper than labor costs in China per hour. So you have a whole country of labor right below the border. So if you're not going to allow immigration uh, and you're thinking about onshoring, you can onshore to the continent. You don't have to onshore to the country. You can onshore to Mexico. Canada has less of a problem with immigration 
but we do have an immigration problem in that the majority of our immigration is familial uh, and not skills-based. So it's, uh, uh, we have somebody who becomes a Canadian resident, they can then apply to bring their parents over. Uh, and then they, once they become citizens, they can then apply to bring their grandparents over or, or et cetera, et cetera. So a lot of the immigration that happens in Canada is familial. And uh, it doesn't necessarily fill an employment gap that we need. Uh, it's not skills-based. Whereas in the U.S., a lot what, what immigration they do have is very skills-based, especially over uh, when you uh, look at Silicon Valley, very skills-based. So it's the type of immigration uh, that you have that can help you solve your, uh, your workforce problem. But if you're looking for 20 years down the road of, listen, how are we going to get another workforce in here? It doesn't matter how you get immigration, skills-based or familial. You're going, if your population is not replicating at a rate fast enough, you're going to have to rely on immigration. This is not a problem that's unique to the U.S. or Canada. Uh, can, almost all developed countries have upside down demographics right now where uh, it looks like this, where previously it would look like this, where this is 65 and this is, uh, you know, zero to, to five, etc. It would look like this. It'd be Every generation would be bigger than the generation before. Well, you have the retiring generation. Uh, actually, it looks, I shouldn't say it looks like that. It looks more like this, like this, this newer generation uh, that's in now. Uh, is smaller than the generation that is retiring. And because of that, almost every developed country is going to have to rely on immigration, including Japan. Uh, if Japan does not do something within 40 years, two generations, their population will be half of what it is right now. So if they want to continue uh, as the third largest economy on the planet, they're going to have to do something. Uh, but... That's another policy that is a big hot button topic uh, issue in Japan as well. So I don't see that happening. But yeah, this, I think if you want to find a political issue that's going to be uh, a theme over the next five, ten years, it will be immigration. That's going to be a huge theme. Uh, don't worry about fair point. That was an answer to another question. Does the potential for the Bank of Canada to be extremely hawkish? relative to the Fed add conviction to the U.S. CAD trade uh, and hence warrant the larger position because I do have a long, uh, a very large long position in, uh, in CAD. Uh, the Canadian dollar is pro-cyclical with uh, global uh, GDP. Uh, the U.S. dollar is counter-cyclical. So if we think we're going into a global recession, the U.S. dollar is still going to be a king for a while. The Canadian will still trail. And we're seeing that now. The Canadian has breached 130, sitting at 130 and a half. Um, I'm long the Canadian, but it does offset some long U.S. dollar positions I have, primarily GM. Because uh, I do have quite a, a large position in GM. And somebody asked me how many figures it was. It is seven uh, figures. Um, so uh, for me... Uh, I have two choices. I can either close uh, my uh, CAD at a profit or I can take delivery of the underlying U.S. Either way works out well for me, which is why this is such a great position for me to have is because heads I win, tails I win. And I always try to find these trades where no matter what the outcome is, I'm going to win in some particular way. I'll either get something I want or I'll make money on something and not get what I want. Either way I win. Um, the U.S. will break, though, once the Fed jumps into the recession camp. And right now, it's a race. It is a race because you see commodity prices cratering right now, and that is the basis of a lot of inflation. You're starting to see transportation rates dropping, and you're starting to see availability of, uh, of uh, shipping uh, avenues opening up as well. Well, that means that there are fewer things being shipped or that supply channels are starting to return uh, to normal operation. So think about it like this. Uh, here is the East Coast. Here is the West Coast. And you have a train leaving the West Coast. It's called the inflation train. You have a train leaving the East Coast, which is called the recession train. They're traveling at different speeds. You remember this from high school. At what point do they meet? Uh, the sooner they meet, the better. So what you don't want is for the inflation train to be really slow and the recession train to be really fast. You're going into a global recession. 
What you would like is the inflation train to be really fast and meet the recession train, uh, you know, <laughs> before it gets too far and then jump trains and say, aha, there we go. That's the best course uh, right now is that uh, the uh, inflation drops faster than we move towards a recession because those are the two themes right now. You have inflation dropping and recession uh, risks increasing and they're both going at a particular speed and right now the Fed is on the inflation train which means we have no driver. The recession train has no driver at this point in time. It'll just run off the rails. So hopefully the inflation train is super fast. It's a bullet train and it can meet the recession train. The Fed can hop over to that and take control before it runs off the rails. If that happens, the US dollar will break. Um, but I don't know when that's gonna happen. And as far as my Canadian position goes, it is large, but it does satisfy another purpose for me. It, uh, it hedges. Yeah, I'm losing money on the hedge. Well, I'm not really losing money on the hedge. I could be making money uh, as the US dollar strengthens and as GM weakens, I could at least say, well, at least I'm making it on the currency, but now I can't. But this is what we're looking for is when, when the Fed will jump trains. And being that we've seen so much come out of inflation, if at the July meeting they say, we only really see the need to go 50 basis points now and maybe September will be 25, there you could see the dollar break. You could, if inflation keeps coming down, if the signal keeps going that, that these prices are coming down, I think we could get there. Um, one question. At 104.40, you said the, you don't see the Fed jumping on the recession camp if unemployment is at 4.1. No, because that's still very low. Uh, I don't think they're going to jump on the recession camp. Um, put it this way. If they don't want to get off the inflation train, they will not jump to the recession train until unemployment is like 6%, 7%. They're not going to, they're not going to leave the job undone. Uh, so, you know. Wouldn't that be considered as high unemployment? 4.1 is still considered as historically very low unemployment. Uh, recession is more likely. Well, recession is more likely as unemployment does increase, but you'd have to get to, I think, more than 4.1. What's your favorite Canadian apartment REIT besides uh, Canadian apartment uh, rentals? I feel like a lot of the other options are subscale below average. Not really. Uh, they pay a lower dividend. They pay a lower dividend, but they have great, uh, great cash flows and great growth. If you look at their payout as a function of FFO, it's really low. That means that they can continue to grow without always issuing new shares. That's a problem with REITs, is if, if you want them to grow, they usually dilute their shareholder base by continually issue new shares. Uh, my, my, my favorite one uh, that I've held for a long time in the U.S., it's not an equity REIT, is Arbor Realty. Uh, I like it because they've been a consistent earner for so many years and they keep raising that dividend, but they have a nasty, nasty habit of always issuing new shares and diluting their shareholders and the stock takes a hit for a couple of, uh, a couple of weeks before it starts to recover. It's just, it's just unsatisfying. Um, the payouts on Killam. Uh, Interrent and Minto are very low, 2.9, 2.5, 2.9, 3.1%. They're low, but they have great growth potential because they can continually reinvest without having to issue uh, new shares. Killam is East Coast, uh, the Maritime Provinces. Uh, Interrent is mostly around Toronto and the Golden Horseshoe down into Hamilton, and I believe there is some Interrent down here in St. Catharines, which is under Lake Ontario. And then Minto, they're concentrated in the Ottawa, Gatineau uh, region. So they don't overlap. They don't compete with each other. So uh, I have all of these along with uh, uh, CAR. Uh, they don't really overlap and they don't compete. Uh, there's only Boardwalk left, BEI, and it has a, a huge exposure to Alberta. And I'm just, I'm just averse to property values in Alberta. So I just, I just don't go near it. I stay away from it, even though it has... Uh, you know, fairly decent options. Uh, no options on any of these. Uh, they're really held for the cash flow and for its growth potential. And listen, apartments aren't going away. Their uh, debt levels are more than respectable, more than respectable. Uh, and their debt has already been put in place at a very low rate to begin with. And it's, it's uh, um, you know, yeah, interest rates are rising. 
But any existing debt that's already in place doesn't have rising rates. They already have existing uh, debt in place. This is one problem I have with uh, some commentary I've seen about uh, the U.S. debt is, oh, interest rates are rising, the debt is 30 trillion, so for every 1%, it's gonna cost this much money per year. No, it doesn't. Only on newly issued debt will there be a higher interest rate. Only on newly issued debt. Uh, and there has been uh, less newly issued debt in the last little while, only because uh, tax collections have been so high. Uh, I'll talk more about that when I do the video on reverse repos. Um, but for uh, their debt levels for these companies, they're fairly solid. The debt's already in place. That cost is not increasing as interest rates increase, by the way. If anything, it's making their debt cheaper because the present value of that debt drops. Uh, but it's all, uh, um, you know, the, the, their debt ratios are, are not excessive. Uh, so I, I don't mind these uh, as far as income and future growth. So for any others uh, that in Canada that I like, there's those three. I like this one the best because it has options that are almost liquid. They're not as liquid as I would like, but they're almost liquid. So I can double the dividend just by playing the options. Give me a REIT that, that, that pays uh, a, a nice dividend and I can double that and give me any company that pays a dividend with good options I can double the dividend every year just playing the options okay this is actually a, a fairly good question here uh, regarding REITs I'm currently interested in adding mortgage REITs for income uh, and read the investment in REITs you recommend but I'm still unsure why mortgage REIT ETF such as REM stay away from that and any of these leveraged ones stay away from can pay dividends as high as 10%. Well, equity REITs, uh, ETFs like uh, VNQ pay only 2.6. I check if the high leverage is the reason, but many high quality equity REITs such as SPG are also highly leveraged. Eh, it's not really, not really. Uh, the author does not say that mortgage REITs are riskier, but does not explain uh, how so. It does say mortgage REITs are riskier, but does not explain how so. Um, and here we have to separate the economic uh, effect uh, versus the accounting effect when we're looking at uh, um, a mortgage REIT's ability to pay dividends. Usually uh, the dividend payout ratio is measured as a function of its net income. Not a very effective way uh, to measure uh, its, its ability to continue to pay the dividends. Keep in mind they invest in mortgage-backed securities. So we're going to take agency as an example and I'll show you the financial statements and what to look for. Well, when you're holding MBS, you receive a dividend. That is the economic effect of holding MBS. Um, can't get around that. I hold a bond, I get a dividend. I should, sorry, not a dividend. I get my interest. I get the coupon payment. Every month, I'll get principal plus coupon. I can then take the principal and reinvest in more MBS, but I get the coupon. I do have income. However, I do have to account for change in fair value. Well, as interest rates are going up, the fair value of these are going down, so I'm going to have income statement losses. That's an accounting effect. So this is an economic effect. I get cash. This is an accounting effect. I have to take a charge against income, which is non-cash. So agency, we have to look at their dividend payout as a function of CFO. What percentage of CFO is going for their dividend payout? 57.41%. That's just cash flow from operations, by the way. 57.41% is their dividend payout ratio as, as a percent of CFO. Can't use income because you have these huge income statement losses, so we'll uh, look at that. So as rates increase, uh, the duration on an MBS increases, which means it's more sensitive to interest rates, which means you have fair value losses that actually increase as rates increase because the duration increases. There's your income statement effect, but your reinvestment of coupon is higher as well. Remember, each payment is going to be interest plus principal. Well, you can take your interest plus principal and reinvest. Well, if rates are going up, you're reinvesting at higher and higher rates. So what's your economic effect is increasing, but your accounting effect is also increasing as well. Well, this is a CFO effect. So my cash flow from operations is actually improving from that. Now, when rates drop, and rates will drop at some point, all these fair value losses will then become fair value gains. Let's have a look at agencies 
statements, the last quarterly statement, and I'll show you what to look for. So here is their balance sheet. Look at the first line, agency securities at fair value. So they are listed on the balance sheet at fair value. We can uh, just keep going down. We don't need to look at much more here. Let's look at the income statement. Interest income, 475. Interest expense, 27. Net interest income, 448. Uh, you have a loss on uh, sale of investment securities. Don't like to see that. That's a bit of a drag. Unrealized loss. This is what we're looking for here. Unrealized loss on investment securities measured at fair value through net income. This is unrealized loss. It's non-cash. Look at the size of that in relation to your net interest income. That's huge, right? Uh, however, they should have seen this coming, so they should have had some swaps in place, gain on derivative instruments and securities, uh, so they were able to offset one point, almost 1.8, uh, what are we looking at, millions, 1.8 uh, billion uh, versus 2.5 billion in mark-to-market, -market, uh, I shouldn't say mark-to-market, mark-to-fair value losses. Uh, so if we uh, go down here, comprehensive income, uh, attribute to common shareholders, uh, negative 1.1 1. Uh, 1 billion. That looks really bad, right? And you're looking at your uh, net income per common share basic and diluted, you know, negative $1.29, but dividends declared per common share is 36 cents. You say, well, you can't keep doing that for very long. Dividends are paid out of cash. A lot of, uh, many of these entries here are non-cash. Let's go down to our cash flow statement. Uh, net cash provided by operating activities, 371. And if you scroll down here, cash dividends paid, 213. 213, 371. Look at their change in cash. Net change in cash is 566 million. 560, even after paying out the 213, you still have 566 million. Uh, so change in cash and cash equivalents, uh, uh, was uh, or sorry cash and cash equivalents at the beginning of the period 1.5 billion at the end of the period uh, 2.09 billion so in looking at uh, mortgage reach you can't look at their net income and say uh, that's the dividend is unsustainable given that net, net income you have to look at their ability to pay which means you have to look at their cash uh, it's better just look at the cash flow from operations versus how much they're paying now if they're paying more than their cash flow from operations that's a significant problem because then you have to start selling stuff just to make your dividend that doesn't make a lot of sense so as far as mortgage REITs, uh, yeah, they suffer when rates go up because of these fair market value losses it squeezes the equity you know, it's not as if you can say, well, if it's only an accounting entry, why bother? It still squeezes the equity such that your equity, shareholders equity amount keeps getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And it depends on what kind of derivatives they're using, how much leverage they have. If it goes too far, you could end up with an insolvent mortgage REIT. That's the risk. So the prices start to drop on mortgage REITs. When rates are dropping, it goes the other way just as quickly because now you have a whole bunch of fair value gains and your equity is expanding rapidly. So if they're not issuing new shares while their, uh, their equity is expanding, the book value per share is increasing just as fast as it was decreasing on the way down. So if you're interested in mortgage REITs, what you would want to do is think about, well, you know, is the high for the 10 year in? Uh, the 10 year hit a high on June 14th. Do you think that's it? Uh, and if you think that's the high of the year, that we're not going to get a higher yield than that, you're probably uh, good to start nibbling on the mortgage REITs now. Start taking some small positions in mortgage REITs. I wouldn't say go all in, but take a 20% you know, position. If you want to buy 1,000 shares, just buy 200 for now uh, and see where uh, rates are. If you think the high is not in for the year on the 10 year, uh, then you don't want to buy any mortgage REITs yet because the equity still has uh, some squeezing out to be done. All right, last question here. First, when are you planning the next round of hat sales? Put me down for a few when the time comes. Next uh, is December uh, because we have our Christmas giving program. Every year uh, we get uh, we sponsor families and we get their Christmas, Christmas uh, wish list and uh, we spend about $600 to $800 per family. And I think last year we did... 29, uh, 29 families representing, I think, 47 kids. Uh, we want to increase it, keep increasing it every year. We do the hat sale in December because all the proceeds from the hat sale 
uh, go towards this plus I match it last year it was uh, uh, I matched it uh, and made a $75 donation to Big Brothers Big Sisters that was on top of our uh, Christmas giving program we also made a big donation to Big Brothers Big Sisters we'll be doing that again this year um, so when we sell a hat I think it's 30 bucks or 35 I then uh, up it all the way to 75 so that we make a $75 donation uh, for each hat sold uh, and last year uh, it was 25000 that we gave to Big Brothers uh, Big Sisters so December we'll be doing it again second what are your views all the tech companies even the large caps that have been obliterated uh, tech does get obliterated uh, if you expect a recession coming up because that's usually the first thing cut if you look at all the layoffs that are happening this year layoffs are happening in two broad areas in uh, mortgages uh, any mortgage department because refis have dropped off the map altogether well that's the biggest part of employment is refi so you don't need them and IT IT job losses usually lead layoffs and uh, so uh, tech gets cut first um emanate a to ramp up substantially could it could or will we just see some or many die uh, both that's usually what happens i think your uh, way into tech at least this would be my way into tech is i would start thinking about a long position uh, in the queues at some point uh, and I would probably be looking to sell puts at levels that I would be comfortable owning the queues anyways. Uh, and then I do have some small little dividend yield on that. It's not much, not much to talk about. But it has high volatility, which means even if I own it, selling calls on the upside is still good income. Uh, that I can, you know, determine a 5 or 6 or 7% dividend yield on it just by selling the upside calls if I own it. But I would be stepping in uh, carefully. Once uh, I've seen that the market has bottomed or it's found a bottom, uh, inflation is slowing down, the Fed looks like it's going to jump uh, uh, tracks and jump onto the recession camp, uh, then I'd be looking to pick winners. Only then would I be looking to pick winners. Typically, winners really don't emerge until uh, um, after uh, the recovery. That, uh, you know, at the bottom of a cycle, like if we think about a business cycle like this, where this is the contraction, this is the bottom, and then we start, uh, there's the last peak. Until you get to the last peak, this is called the recovery. Winners don't start emerging till about here, and then you still have the expansion period. So I have time to pick winners. I don't have to pick them. I don't have to pick them now. All I want to do is get exposure to tech. I'll get it with QQQ. If I want to get some very good exposure, uh, rather than just selling puts, I can use a synthetic, uh, which doesn't require me to put out a lot of money. Synthetics are free because uh, you're selling a put to buy a call at about the same price. If I want to get really aggressive, I can use a leveraged synthetic, which means rather than having uh, uh, a, a delta, uh, that is equal to 1, I can probably get a delta closer to 1.4 to 1.5, uh, which means my payoff chart looks like uh, this. I have this huge amount of leverage in between the call uh, and the put. So I'm going to buy an in-the-money call, and I'm going to sell an in-the-money put uh, to still get me uh, zero, zero cost for it, but I'm going to have a leveraged synthetic call. I would probably start with selling puts, and then when I feel very comfortable, I might move into a, uh, a leveraged uh, synthetic or a risk reversal. Risk reversals are nice on, on high volatility uh, ETFs, uh, but that's how I would start it. And then I would pick winners later. After we've gone through, uh, through this phase here, and it looks like we're starting the recovery, then I would start to look around and say, okay, what's the theme? Uh, it's very rare that last cycle's winners are the next cycle's winners. It's very, or, or, or you know, the hot stocks. It's very rare uh, that they are, that they continue on like that. And that'll wrap that up for this week.